everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you today about how I learned to stop worrying and love legacy code, and how hopefully you might be able to too. So uh, my name is Hannah Hasi. I'm from Cambridge. I currently work for a company called GrabCAD, uh, which is a 3D printing uh, software outfit. First of all, let's clarify what we mean by legacy code. I do not mean <coughs> crappy code. Uh, code that was just plain bad when it was written. Uh, as Nicole Roach and Andreas Leidig say on their pair blog about object-oriented programming, today's produced code will be tomorrow's legacy. If we allow the use of the word legacy as a synonym for crap, then we have the perfect excuse for producing crappy code. We should care more about tomorrow's legacy. We should be proud of yesterday's work, today, tomorrow, in five years' time. For example, this is my grandparents' house. It is a legacy house. <laughs> it was built over 100 years ago. Since then, it's been adapted and modified in numerous ways. Uh, double glazing's been fitted. It's been connected to electricity and then to the internet. Uh, a bathroom was added downstairs. But throughout this whole time, it was lived in and enjoyed. And we're <coughs> proud of it. We're proud of the people who originally built it and we're proud of the state that it's in today. It's legacy, but it's not crap. However, <laughs> Leidig recounts a story about a Russian friend, saying, I have a Russian friend that possessed a seven-year-old larder. It was slightly legacy, but complete crap. <laughs> we once bought a brand new replacement part for it, a rear axle. It was cheap, but crap from the start. Of course, the car was running most of the time, but uh, we often had the feeling that we were lucky to reach our destination. <laughs> time for an anecdote. Uh, so I spent one summer at university working on a classic legacy code problem. A scientist uh, working for my employers had written a large piece of Fortran 95 uh, to, com to simulate a complex manufacturing process. And they wanted me to add a small extra feature to it. As a summer intern, um, I was kind of freaked out by this. This guy had long since retired and there was no way to contact him about the code base or to ask for any clarifications. They were still using the code and found it reliable, um, but as I was trying to add this little extra functionality, I felt like a software archaeologist digging through terse comments and variable names trying to figure out not only what the code was doing, but also what the process it was simulating was supposed to look like. It felt very difficult to get anywhere. My initial reaction, and I think a reaction that a lot of us share, is to rewrite it. My idea was to tear it down completely and rebuild it, preferably in a different, more modern language. Then I thought I could actually implement the change that they wanted. But my manager was completely against this idea. So far as they were concerned, as a summer intern, I would leave soon anyway. If I rewrote the code base, what was the benefit to the company? They already had something that was working. They just needed something uh, that was a little bit different than what they already had. At the time, I was really frustrated by this. I would recount the anecdote in a wistful tone, saying, if only I could have rewritten it, it would have been so much better. But would it have been? I'd like to read you a quote from one of my favorite books, A Deepness in the Sky, uh, by Werner Bingy. We should rewrite it all, said Bam. It's been tried. But even the top levels of the fleet system code are enormous. You and a thousand of your friends would have to work for a century or so to reproduce it. And guess what? Even if you did, by the time you finish, you'd have your own set of inconsistencies. And you still wouldn't be consistent with all the applications that might be needed now and then. The word for all this is mature programming environment. <laughs> uh, thanks to Gareth Reese for the quote. In the blog post uh, where he talks about this, he continues, I often think of this passage when taking on a new project. And usually I conclude that Finchie was optimistic. It doesn't take hundreds or thousands of years to reach a mature programming environment in which complexity is overwhelming and change is expensive and error-prone, it's quite possible to get there in only a few years. 
We're all programmer archaeologists now. So why do we want to rewrite code? There are a few different factors that I'd like to talk you through uh, that compelled me to want to rewrite this code. And uh, I think it's pretty common to all of us. First of all, the desire to write in a new language. Next, a desire to gain an understanding, a lack of trust, and finally, it looks ugly. So, a new language. The new language might be considered to be better. It has features that we want, or the old language is considered to be passe. Fortran 95 certainly wasn't the best language to be writing new code in. For one thing, there was a severe restriction on variable and routine name length. Uh, We've put backward compatibility with earlier versions of Fortran. Uh, for those that don't know, this is six characters, which is super helpful when you're trying to understand variable names. Um, Paul Graham has a fun rant about Lisp uh, called Averages, uh, where he claims that uh, different programming languages have wildly different power levels, uh, and that Lisp is the most powerful language of all, so we should all use Lisp. Um, so maybe your rewrite would help a lot. Maybe it would expose you to features and powers from a different language that you don't currently have. But most cases aren't as clear-cut as this. I think most people wouldn't choose to rewrite a large C program in Rust, for example, even if they can agree that Rust has some extra features that they prefer. So this is supposedly a quote from Richard Feynman's Blackboard. Jeff Atwood uh, on the Coding Horror blog uses it as a sort of devil's advocate justification for complete code rewrites. It's uh, in a blog post called, When Understanding Means Rewriting. He says, does the source code really tell the story of the application? I'm not so sure. Maybe the best way to understand an application is, paradoxically, to ignore the source code altogether. <laughs> if you want to know how the application really works, observe carefully how users use it. Then go and write your own version. I'm not sure he's entirely serious with this argument. Um, there's the obvious caveat that it's hard to understand old code full stop, even your own. Um, if I took this approach, I'd be rewriting code that I wrote written six months ago all the time, rather than taking a moment to try and understand what on earth I was trying to do. Along with this understanding issue, we also encounter a lack of trust. Because we find it hard to understand other people's code, we find it hard to trust them, to trust that their code will work and do what we want it to do. This is often called not invented here syndrome. Especially since many of us have poorer code reading than writing skills, it's difficult to relax and trust own unknown programmers, uh, particularly people who weren't around at the same time as you, so you've never actually met these people and worked with them in person. Jamie Zawinski calls uh, the negative version of this the cascade of attention deficit teenagers model. Um, Jamie says, I report bugs. They go unread for a year, sometimes two, and then, surprise, that module is rewritten from scratch. And the new maintainer doesn't check whether their version has actually solved any of the known problems that existed in the previous version. I love this quote from Keiichi Yano. You can't look down on someone when you read their code. If you don't respect the person writing the code, you won't be able to apply the energy needed to understand it. In the Python world, we seem to have somewhat overcome this. When we're dealing with third-party modules, for some reason, if you can pip install something to do what you want, people don't usually tend to feel a strong desire to look under the hood and see how it does what it does. Uh, we trust the API and we trust the module to act basically like a black box um, and just use the documentation as all we need to work with it. That's certainly a strong factor in the appeal of uh, Python as a language. I don't know how accessible it is to other programming language communities. And finally, the real reason, the one that we feel deep inside. <laughs> it looks ugly. Uh, it has 
a crazy relationship between different parts. It has a tiny amount of test coverage. Uh, let's be real, it has no test coverage at all. <laughs> it sometimes makes us want to laugh out loud when we read the code. It's a big hot mess. We have this strong temptation to start again from scratch, just out of an instinct for aesthetic perfection. Why is it so ugly? Uh, let me introduce those who don't know to Mayor Lehman, who evolved a series of laws of programming called uh, Lehman's Laws of Software. This is one of them. As an evolving program is continually changed, its complexity, reflecting deteriorating soft structure, increases unless work is done to maintain or reduce it. Imagine thinking it was enough to just build a house and then live in it indefinitely. Things would start to go wrong after a while. Not least, you need to clean it. People remodel all the time uh, to fit spaces to their needs, and the same needs to be done with code. It has to be flexed and continually maintained in order to retain its functionality. We need folks who are focused on mending code as well as just implementing new features. People who are satisfied by the task of maintaining existing code. This job is important and I think that we really don't give enough uh, credit to people who are menders. You may have come across the idea of technical debt. Um, but thinking about it, where does technical debt come from? I have a great quote from Ariel De Martini who says, as soon as you rest for a while, you'll be producing a little tiny particle of legacy code. The problem with particles of legacy code is that they're like gems of corals. They tend to attract other bad code and they soon become hard as hell to remove. So the source of some of these bad patterns is just us relaxing for a little while, writing code that doesn't actually quite meet our standards. Ward Cunningham complained that people confused his technical debt metaphor with the idea that you could write code poorly to start with and then promise to fix it later. That definitely wasn't supposed to be the primary source of debt. So, okay, maybe getting rid of the code isn't that great of an idea. Uh, but why should we keep it, anyway? There are three main reasons. First of all, commercial concerns. So uh, Joel Spolsky, uh, writing on the blog Joel on Software, has called rewriting source code from scratch the single worst strategic mistake that any software company could make. Uh, Spolsky uses the example of Netscape 6.0 to demonstrate why as a corporate strategy, rewrites are generally bad news. They tend to take longer than anticipated because it's hard to plan for a complete rewrite. Uh, estimating that kind of thing is notoriously hard. Um, and so you're working on the rewrite and possibly maintaining the existing code base at the same time for quite a while. Until you can finally push the rewrite out the door, uh, people don't see any of the improvements that you can make. And by that time, maybe a competitor has caught up to you and eaten your lunch. There are almost no commercial examples where a large-scale complete rewrite turned out to be a good idea. Sometimes, as programmers, we need to zoom out and think about a uh, more general view of our company's trajectory and how time spent on rewrites and refactoring might play into that. Here's Ward Cunningham again, speaking about technical debt. Shipping first-time code is like going into debt. A little debt speeds development, as long as it is paid back promptly with a rewrite. Objects make the cost of this transaction tolerable. The danger occurs when the debt is not repaid. Who's to say that the complete rewrite won't just introduce other problems? <laughs> Maybe we'll fix those with an extra rewrite, <laughs> just to be sure. Of course, it's all very well to say that we shouldn't adopt these bad practices. Companies need to take care not to pressure their programmers into behaving in negative ways. If you're rewarded, for instance, based on new code output um, or some other metric that doesn't take into account the increase in understanding that you get just from reading code, uh, it's really hard to do the right thing. Managers should try to encourage their programmers to grow an understanding of the existing code base and take into account that that understanding takes time to build. Uh, we could all take a leaf from the book People Were Here and accept that human resources aren't actually interchangeable. People contain 
uh, valuable institutional knowledge, including about our code bases, um, and that's important to, to cultivate. This is a page from one of my favorite books, How Buildings Learn, by Stuart Brand. These are two apartment buildings that were built in New Orleans in the 1830s. And this is what they look like today. As you can see, they've grown and changed quite a bit. One of them has uh, added on an entire new story, another one has expanded sideways. They've gained some balconies and all kinds of fun and interesting internal features uh, that change the way that they behave. However, they've been lived in that entire time um, by generations of folks who have used them and enjoyed them. Polsky uh, points out that hairy legacy code functions embody years of bug fixes and reactions to specific situations. If we completely rewrite code and get rid of that, um, then we're losing the knowledge that's embedded in the code base as well. Another quote from him, the idea that new code is better than old is patently absurd. Old code has been used. It has been tested. Lots of bugs have been found and they've been fixed. There's nothing wrong with it. It doesn't acquire bugs just by sitting around on your hard drive. Oh, contraire, baby. Is software supposed to be like an old Dodge Dart that rusts just sitting in the garage? Is software like a teddy bear that's kind of gross if it's not made out of all new material? But not only that. Legacy code often embodies knowledge about a process, knowledge that is very difficult to recapture. The writers might perhaps have left the company, been run over by the proverbial bus, retired, like the scientists that uh, I had to read the code. Rewrites don't capture all of the nuances of details that are literally embedded in the code as comments or variable names. I've lost track of the number of times that a cryptic comment has led me to track down changes in our hardware that were actually important, for instance. If I decided to rewrite the code and just get rid of comments or names that I didn't understand, I would lose all of that information. There wouldn't be a way to recover it. So it turns out that code reading is a skill in itself that is completely, well, partly distinct from programming. And we can learn it. We can learn to do it better. I particularly recommend these two books. Uh, Code Reading, The Open Source Perspective by Diamandis Finaus, which takes a lot of large samples of code. Uh, the book actually comes with a CD full of open source projects that you are encouraged to go into and read through. Um, and it spends chapters and chapters just going through different ways that these libraries and modules uh, work and just ways to dissect them and understand them better. It's a fantastic read. Spinellis says, make it a habit to spend time reading high quality code others have written. Just as reading high quality prose will enrich your vocabulary, trigger your imagination and expand your mind, examining the innards of a well-designed software system will teach you new architectural patterns, data structures, coding methods, algorithms, style and documentation conventions, APIs, or even a new language. I also really recommend the book, Your Code as a Crime Scene, by Adam Tornhill. It's available from the Pragmatic Programmers bookstore. Uh, Tornhill uses the techniques of criminal profiling to track down problems in code bases. Uh, the idea is that uh, forensics combines uh, various attributes uh, of criminal activity to try and work out whereabouts the perpetrator might be based. Um, so with code, uh, he wrote a code profiling tool called CodeMart, uh, which goes through a code base uh, using uh, Subversion or Git or Mercurial or whatever your uh, version control system is, and tracks down and correlates areas of churns, lots of changes, and areas of high psychomatic complexity. And it points to usually a few files where there are probably some dodgy things going on that you can improve on straight away. Um, it's a nice way to be able to get started with doing some low-hanging fruit refactoring uh, without worrying about having to understand the entire legacy code base at once. So uh, we can learn this skill. Uh, it's definitely something that we can improve on. Um, 
Another place that I love to go to learn about reading and understanding Legacy Code is the podcast Legacy Code Rocks. Uh, it can be found at legacycode.rocks. Uh, and it's fabulous. Every couple of weeks, they interview someone who either specializes in maintaining code or has written a tool that helps people to understand and improve legacy stuff. Uh, so I would argue that refactoring is the best of both worlds. Rather than having to completely throw out legacy code um, and rewrite it, or to treat it really tentatively because we don't understand it, therefore we're afraid to change anything in case everything breaks. Um, we can start by adding test coverage and then we can make small cautious changes that can really add up over time. Using automated tools like Code Climate, we can target our refactoring to the places that really matter and will really count. Even a 0.1% improvement of test coverage over time actually adds up over the period of a year or two. You can see noticeable changes in a legacy code base until it's almost unrecognizable. So, uh, some conclusions. We should help ourselves mentally commit to long-term maintenance of legacy code bases. They're not gonna go away anytime soon, um, and they're actually full of gems and useful things. So. I found that reading the books really helped. Uh, if podcasts are your thing, uh, Legacy Code Rocks uh, is a great one to get started with. We should try and fight our first instinct. Sometimes it's really powerful, so it helps to step back and just try and reevaluate why we feel so negatively about a piece of legacy code. We should try and assume good faith from the original authors and to respect the code base. Even if we don't like the style that it's written in, uh, it is being used and valued right now. Unlike cutting edge applications that we might work on, the next Facebook, uh, it already has a group of users who value it just as it is, and it probably has a real impact in the world. A lot of these legacy systems are running deeply important things, like banking, healthcare, all kinds of things. They need to be taken care of, and they've already proven their worth. There is a community of people who are dedicated to maintaining and improving legacy code. Um, and if you get a little down about dealing with a legacy system, it helps to join them. Uh, legacy Code Rocks has a Slack channel that I enjoy uh, contributing to. Uh, we can refactor, little by little, um, using proven good techniques. Uh, so that when we turn around a couple of years down the line, the legacy code base is something that we can be proud of again. Uh, so yeah, references and Thank you very much. Very interesting talk. Thank you, Hannah. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yeah. Um, I have a question. You've mentioned uh, refactoring as an alternative to whole rewriting. Do you have any specific resources for people that have now been handed in from Legacy Code and need to start refactoring over time? Or how do you conduct it properly? Sure. Um, so I can't remember the name of the blog post right now, but there's a really good one on LegacyCode.rocks about this particular issue. Um, the overall technique that I would suggest is to treat it as a black box to start with, um, to just start, um, first of all, have some kind of smoke test for it. Um, and then gradually model the inputs and outputs of the system until you're fairly confident that you will notice if you've broken something in a major way. Um, Python is actually quite good uh, for wrapping around uh, test coverage around legacy systems, like stuff written in Fortran or COBOL, for instance. Um, again, I can't think of the name of the blog post right now, but I will look it up after the talk.